disclaimers. I'm going to jump into it since we're all running a little bit on the late side. So I've been a naturopathic physician for just about 17 years. As Dr. Holt was mentioning, um, I've actually practiced for 17 years. I also was a dean. I had the privilege recently to have written a book with Dr. Roundtree, medical doctor, on clinical handbooks and so forth. So I enjoy writing. I'm also executive director of Institute for Healthy Aging. And we're going to talk about iodine today. We all know the literature about vitamin D, and there seems to be a health policy issue in the United States. We tell people, don't salt your food, it's going to cause you to have blood pressure problems. But when we take something away, we have to give something back. In the 1920s, as we're going to discuss today, we're going to talk about mechanisms and conditions and research. But when we take something away, we have to give it back. So we say, don't salt your food. Well, we had iodinized salt. So well, you have to say, well, this is another way to get your iodine. If we say, don't go out in the sun because we get melanoma, basal carcinoma, squamous cell. Well, we have to give back that vitamin D. But we don't do that. And so as physicians, we can intervene and hopefully help guide health policy. So when we take things away, we actually give them back. So, of course, iodine deficiency is one of the number one leading conditions which we can actually prevent mental retardation, brain damage. We're going to talk about breast cancer today. We're going to talk about attention deficit. We're going to talk about lots of different things, including also IQ. We're going to have a couple of slides showing that IQ overtly lower in iodine deficient areas to the dull area of the IQ opposed to the highly intelligent, even with a moderately adequate amount. So the statistics are prevalent here with 1.6 billion people at risk for deficiency. But in the U.S., we're seeing more and more of this in our clinical practice. We're seeing it. I do a lot of iodine testing in practice, and we're seeing about 80% of our patients with iodine insufficiency. To, this is to differentiate from overt deficiency as defined by the World Health Organization. So the real key here is overt disease versus subclinical disease. You know, do people have scurvy in today's world? Probably not. But do they have bleeding gums, poor connective tissue healing? Are they suboptimal with vitamin C? If you look at the primates in the zoo, they get fed four to 6,000 milligrams a day because they can't make vitamin C. Well, we can't either, but our cats and dogs can. So once again, the whole stressful events. So interesting is, let's assume you're doing all the iodine. You're doing a great job. You're eating a sea vegetarian diet. You're eating seaweed. You're doing everything kind of more on the Asian vegetarian style. But now we tell our patients, go exercise. And we go tell them to go exercise. And actually, the research shows they can become deplete. So most of the dietary iodine we take in gets excreted in our urine. That's why urinary tests are great. And we'll discuss a couple of tests that I like to use in my clinical practice. But more importantly, we can lose a significant amount in our sweat. So now you have a person, they're exercising, and they're not really seeing the weight loss that they want to see. Or maybe they're actually starting to get hypothyroidish a little bit. Or maybe they have a little bit more fibromyalgia. This links between lower iodine levels and fibromyalgia. Or now their fibrocystic breasts are getting worse, but they're drinking the same amount of caffeine, and they're doing the same amount of coffee, known contributors to fibrocystic breast disease. But we're seeing contributions here. But out of the 2005 journal article, sweat iodide losses are, that are not replaced actually can become depleted in a training regime and actually cause thyroid problems and potential decreased performance. So the question is, if they're doing a drink to replace their electrolytes, are they losing this trace mineral, which is potentially as important as a sodium or potassium? The history, of course, is Lugol's was very, very popular until Armour Thyroid was introduced. And then we shifted our paradigm a little bit to the Band-Aid approach opposed to figuring out why is the thyroid underperforming. In my clinical practice, I prescribe Levoxyl and Synthroid and time release and all those kinds of things in Armour Thyroid. But of course, Lugol, of course, came up with a clever concept to combine both iodine and iodide. Very important that he did that because, after all, some tissues like iodine and some tissues like iodide. And what's interesting is we often get very narrow-minded, and I have in my clinical practice. I get into my little fads. But we often forget important things. Like, for example, lithium, right? That's for the bipolar patient. Well, really, it's not. It's a mineral right above that, sodium and potassium. But we kind of categorize it as a drug. But lithium orotate is very, very helpful for a multitude of benefits, even including alcoholism. Of course, we do magnesium, we do calcium. Of course, what about strontium for bone density? Research shows that 340 milligrams twice a day over two years increased bone density by 15%. So we forget things, and we forget the humble little cobalt there with methylcobalamin, only vitamin with a metal molecule, B12. And of course, then we have our fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodine, our points of conversation today. And of course, we're going to have what a discussion about the halide wars, 
how our fluorinated water, our brominated breads, are further contributing to this iodine deficiency. So not only has iodine levels dropped in our diet, there's perchlorates and other halides, which are then pushing iodine further out of our body, compounding multiple, multiple times over the problem. So the pan-epidemic problem, 70% of the world's population is estimated to be iodine deficient. So of course, Americans are not immune to that. In fact, we actually failed the World Health Organization's recommendations for iodine carte blanche. And interesting, 20 years ago, 3% of the population failed to have enough iodine per World Health Organization standards. Now we're at a, a full, fourfold increase of that problem. And that's overt deficiency, not insufficiency, not optimal loss, but just overtly broken. And once again, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism reporting this fact. So they're saying there's an issue, but the number is much bigger than that. So general note, pasteurization destroys approximately 20% of iodine content of pasteurized foods. And this presentation actually will be available in booth 303. I'm going to go through this quickly because we're starting a little late, but everybody can get a copy of the presentation. So vegetarians. Lots of people are going towards a more vegetarian diet, either through principle and or mad cow disease or the hormones and pollutants and higher eating animals. And they actually did a study, and iodine excretion was significantly lower in alternative, that's what they call it, alternative nutrition groups, 172 micrograms per liter in vegetarians, 78 in vegans, and 216 in omnivores. And 25% of vegetarians and 80% of vegans suffer from iodine deficiency. That's because we stop at the shoreline. We don't keep on eating the green stuff in the ocean. We're land vegetarians. We're not sea vegetarians. The other thing is the food is only as replete in iodine as the soil in which we harvest it from. So just like we have selenium deficiency up in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, of course, we know in the Great Lakes area, of course, tremendous iodine deficiency. But once again, a lot of the soil just doesn't have it. Plus, from farming practices, if you think of Little House in the Prairie, 1800s, virgin soil, that first crop that went to the Olsons, the mercantile, was rich of food, of nutrients. But year after year, no one's replacing those trace minerals. And of course, it's going to have less and less, no matter what, let alone our farming practices. So once again, seeing that a vegetarian, so now a person's coming into your clinical practice, you're worried about B12 and calcium and iron in that vegetarian, well, what about their iodine levels? So once again, another way to look at, but why is that, why do they have fibromyalgia? Why do they have fatigue? Why are they having fibrocystic breast disease? They're living the healthy life, but are they? Sometimes we defeat ourselves. So there's lots of historical uses of iodine. And of course, we all know this as clinicians, but iodine's, Key player here, of course, T4, four iodines, T3, three iodines. Of course, reverse T3, you can just see where the iodines are placed, and of course, T2. And so the question is, why is T4 less powerful than T3? Many of you already know the answer, but it's all about steric hindrance. So we know T3 is three to five times more powerful. So in my clinical practice, I'm always measuring free T3 and free T4, along with the thyroid peroxidase antibodies and TSH and other things. But it's all about steric hindrance. We either have the choice of having a hydrogen or an iodine, and we were all told this when we were taking biochemistry and organic chemistry, but the clinical implications of all the steric hindrance and molecular structure, but you have this high, larger iodine molecule here, and it's not going to go into the receptor as well, and that's why T3 is significantly more powerful than T4. It's all about steric hindrance.